Hello, hello, this is Dr. Z. Zachary Brooks with the latest installment of Culture, Cognition, and Change. Today we're talking about cross-cultural decision-making. This is part two. Hopefully you've already listened to part one and you're excited to hear what comes next in part two. So as I've shared before, um, this uh, originally I did this um, presentation in Mexico, which is a part of a week-long series of presentations I gave. Uh, I gave at La Universidad Popular Autónoma del Estado de Puebla. Um, I was asked at the time to re-record them because the recording I made at the time in the live studio audience wasn't a studio audience, it just sounded cool. The live audience um, were good recordings just to listen to one just individually, but they weren't really good enough to share once again. So I thought I would re-record them and I was asked to re-record them. And um, this happened uh, originally in 2018. The entire series that week was called Culture, Cognition, and Change. This is part four of that uh, series. Uh, part one uh, had to do with intercultural competence. Part two was brain and language. Part three was bilingual decision making, which I recorded in Spanish, La Toma de Decisiones Bilingües, um, a couple days ago. And now I'm on to part four for Culture, Cognition, and Change. And as I shared in part one of this, this is kind of a hodgepodge of different things. Um, it's not you know, some sort of pure conversation about cross-cultural decision-making, but it should give us kind of a flavor of what's, what's out there. Culture, cognition, and change. The three C's, this is Dr. Z, that's me. Part two of two, here we are, cross-cultural decision-making. So where we left off uh, last time was with the ultimatum game that already sounds pretty serious, the ultimatum game. Like you're given an ultimatum, you have to do one thing or the other. So the ultimatum game. So let's get back to it. Ultimatum game developed in 1982. This is by Guth, Schmidtberger and Schwarzer. 1982, Deutschland. So these are some German researchers in 1982, and they developed the ultimatum game. And here's the game. So there's, there's a first person. So I'll, before we get to the, the rules, let's say you're walking along the street, and a person stops you. And they say, hey, I have a deal for you. I'll give you some money, but there's some conditions. And the conditions are what follows. So you're just given some money from a random person. You are a random person to them. And then you have to deal with another random person. And in the next slide, I'll use some little uh, cartoon icons to demonstrate these. So the first person, let's say that's you, is given some money. Um, let's say it's $10 or something like that. The second person, um, excuse me, the first person is given some money. Number two, um, you, the first person, offers some of this money, which you were just given, to a second person. The second person, who's called a responder, um, the second person can accept or reject the proposal. So you're given $10. Now you have to offer some of that $10. You're the proposer. The other person who, who re uh, receives your, your offer, the responder, can either accept or reject the proposal. The second person, if the second person accepts your proposal, the money is split based on the offer. So let's say you have $10, you offer um, four to that person and they accept it, then that's the end of the game. You go on, you keep six dollars, you're six dollars richer, and that person gets four dollars just for being close to you, that's all. Uh, no, but if the second person rejects the proposal, both players receive nothing. So that is a really key um, rule in this entire scenario because that is kind of the controlling, even though it comes last, in the list of rules. In some way, it's the controlling variable here because if you, you, you need to know ahead of time, if you offer an amount that is low or it offends someone, you know, it upsets their, their sensibilities of what's a fair proposal, then you get nothing from this whole thing. And why would someone who, them, that second person who would get a dollar out of the ten dollars, why would they reject that? It's a one dollar more than they had otherwise. Why would they reject that, get no money from themselves, and then punish you? So what are the rational decisions in this game? What are the rational decisions in this game? So the next slide, we have kind of the same thing, but in, in picture form. 
So you are on the street with your friend. Let's say it's a friend at this point. You and your friend are walking by a random person. A person offers you 200 pesos, about $10. You can keep the money on one condition. You share some of it with your friend or a random person. So oftentimes these experiments are done in uh, rooms on a university campus and you don't know the other person. That's how they're done. And sometimes they can be done online, so it's just a fictional person or it can be a live player, but you can't actually see them. So you can do this um, scenario in various ways, and each of those has their own um, different results. But we're just talking about the basic idea. So you get, you're given some money, and you can keep it on one condition. You share some of it with your friend. Now, how much do you offer? If your friend rejects your offer, both of you get zero. In this case, zero pesos. So what do you do? What do you do? How much do you offer? And do you think your offer would change if you're using your first or second language, if you're in a first or second or different cultural context? What do you think? Well, some researchers have actually asked that question. So some Dutch researchers, uh, Österreich, Sloof, and Van den Kuelen, 2004 it looks like. I think that's a close to correct pronunciation. And they basically um, asked and studied the question of whether people's behaviors using a second, um, in their second culture or whatever, would change. And what they found is that around the world, so what they did is a, a huge, um, huge meta-analysis. A meta-analysis means there's a lot of similar studies uh, using the ultimatum game, and these guys took all of those studies, I think it was over 70, and they put them all basically in an Excel spreadsheet or some other really good data um, software, and they compared the results. How do people in different cultural contexts respond? And what they found is that in the proposals around the world, and they compared you know, all the major regions of the world, Asia, North America, Europe, South America, Africa, there's no real difference um, in proposals. So people around the world, if they're given $10 or that equivalent, they propose you know, around that 40% mark. That's kind of a general number. It's like, wow, okay, cool. So there's humans are humans around the world. We have some sense of fairness, and if we're given 100 of something and we're told we need to propose something uh, to someone else, give some of that to someone else, we kind of aim for that 40% mark, which seems intuitively about right. You keep more of it. It was your money to begin with, but you benefit someone else and you're not going to offend that person if you're offering around the 40% mark. Not everyone does, but that's an average sort of amount. But the rejections were different. So the researchers found that Asian responders have a significantly higher rejection rates. Why would that be? You know, are they more easily offended? You know, what's, what's going on there? Um, so that was already kind of an interesting result that around the world, you know, people propose similar amounts, but they're in one part of the world. And I'll talk about some different, uh, other differences in the next slide. And the Asian responders, generally speaking, reject at a higher rate. So if you offer, let's say, 32%, maybe they would reject that because they would see that as unfair in some way, dishonoring that moment. You know, you want to be fair in that moment to that other person. So that was an interesting kind of result. Now let's see how this um, same game, the ultimate game, plays out in different places in the world. So uh, a guy named Ingotat, who's very famous in the cultural uh, space, it really did some really cool things. He used individualism and collectivism to compare proposers and responders' behavior. And he found no difference. So he used measures individualism, so how individual, uh, or let's say how individualistic a country is, so the United States would be considered more individualistic. Mexico would be considered less individual, individualistic or more collective. And he found that it didn't really change people's uh, behaviors. In this case, their proposers' and responders' behaviors. So that's interesting. Um, back to our, our researchers, Ustebeck, Sloof, and Van der Kuhlen. They used the higher um, respect for authority um, to measure whether or not this would change um, participants' behavior. And he said it lowers the proposer's rates in a country where there's a higher respect for authority. And that can be uh, thought of in different ways. You can think about a respect for 
major religion or a religious institution in a country, if a country has more of a hierarchical structure or more of a hierarchical tradition, it actually lowered the proposer's rates, but it didn't change the response rates at all, which is kind of fascinating. Um, Heinrich 2000 studied an Amazonian tribe in Peru and UCLA graduate students. This is called the Machi Guenga, Machi Guenga participants. So they proposed on average 26% of whatever total. So let's say it's $10 on average, they offered uh, $2.60. UCLA graduate, UCLA graduate students, on the other hand, on average proposed $4.08, or 48% of a total of $10, let's say. So the, the tribe responders accepted all offers under 20%. So this was an interesting thing already to compare UCLA graduate students versus uh, Machiguenga participants. So participants in the, in the tribe, they um, accepted all offers under 20%. So for that second person, they figured it was more money they had previously, so why not accept it? And so they have a very different cultural sort of point of view, and maybe it's related to some economics, or maybe it's related to a lot of things. Whatever it's related to, they have a different point of view. Hey, it's more money than I had one second ago, so I'll accept it even if it's very little of his total. Whereas UCLA graduate students, they're offering nearly half of the money they just received in order to keep half of it. And they don't want to upset the person they're proposing to. So maybe they, they have an intuitive sense that if they um, offer 350 or 4 to the other person, they're likely to get zero. So they're going to push that amount as high as possible uh, in order to keep something. Something is better than nothing. So this is already an interesting difference between proposer and um, respondent's behavior. And Marlowe, 2004, studied a Hadzu tribe in Sanzania who rejected 24% of the offers. Now, this is really fascinating. This tribe rejected 24% of the offers, but that high rejection rate led to an over, overall higher earnings for the tribe. So this tribe, each person, when presented this scenario individually, was more likely to reject than another tribe somewhere else in the world or another group of people somewhere else in the world. And, but what they were doing over time, um, apparently, is helping each other out. Because if you're early in this process and you reject it, that proposer then goes to the next person and knows that he or she needs to go higher in order to have this, um, this little transaction succeed. And the higher uh, the, proposed, the proposed earnings went, the better their overall earnings were for the tribe, even though one out of every four um, propose, propose, uh, proposals was rejected by a tribe member. So there's some interesting differences how this ultimatum game plays out. So my results were first and second language speakers offered equal amounts, which kind of comports with what we found um, earlier that around the world proposers' behavior when analyzed in this meta-analysis doesn't really change. So people are people around the world. We have some intuitive sense of fairness in a transaction where we're given some money randomly and for free, and, but we're, we're asked to offer some of that money to someone else. Otherwise, we would lose it all. So let's move on from the ultimatum game. Now let's go through a couple scenarios and just ask yourself always, uh, culturally, do people's behavior change? So next. So the next slide is going to appear very, very quickly because you have this on video. You can pause it and study it as long as you want. I'm going to go through it very quickly. So. Ready? Calculate the following. Okay. Calculate the following. Okay. So we just uh, presented two series of numbers and asked you to multiply those numbers, calculate those numbers, and what the amounts um, will be, the, the totals will be. So this refers to an anchoring bias. And when you have um, 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7 times 8 versus when you have um, the next amount, oops, let me just put it all out here, then we can talk about it a little bit more. So 
when you present participants with 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7 times 8 versus 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So when you order these numbers differently, 1 to 8 versus 8 to 1, people um, guess differently. And why would they guess differently? So that n first number is really, really critical. So it's called the anchoring bias. And so oftentimes in life we're presented with some information, and that first piece of information anchors our guesses overall. And you can see that plays out in some research where the average uh, amount people guess with 1 times 8 is 512. The average guess is for 8 up until 1 is 2,250. The actual correct answer is 40,000. So both groups, I forget where this was uh, cited, are incorrect. Very incorrect. But what's fascinating here is that the anchor, in this case the number, actually sets the tone for where the guesses will be, even if the guesses are not close to what the, the actual number is. So next, which is more likely to kill you, your dog or your couch? Which is more likely to kill you, your dog or your couch? This one is interesting, and one of the reasons this is interesting, just this is just now anecdotal evidence doing presentations around the world, especially in Mexico and the United States. So when I'm in the United States, the overwhelming answer to this question, which is more likely to kill you, is dog. When I'm in Mexico, the overwhelming answer I'm given is always furniture, couch. So which is more likely to kill you? So that's also already a cultural sort of snapshot. Now the States, people are much more inclined to believe that a dog is more likely to kill you versus a couch. In Mexico, people are much more inclined to believe that a couch will kill you versus a dog. <laughs> Why would that be? I don't know, but it's pretty fascinating already. Next one. Later today, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, you will get in a car accident. Hopefully you're not listening to this uh, podcast when you do get in that car accident. Uh, that would make me feel bad. Um, but later today, let's say you get in a car accident. Which is more likely? For the next couple of weeks, you will drive more cautiously, or for the next couple of weeks, you will drive as you did prior to the accident. So you continue to drive um, a little bit fast, or will you slow down? Those are kind of the basic answers. And most people would say, I would drive more cautiously. So now that we've kind of gone through a couple of these scenarios, let's actually see what the correct answers are. This is the least information from the United States. So what is more likely to kill you, your dog or your couch? This is called the availability bias. So the, the information that's available to you is the one you'll, you'll go with, but oftentimes you're incorrect. So a famous example is if there is an airplane accident where an airplane falls from the sky and 100 people die, a very tragic thing. Ha um, if that happened yesterday, and then people are asked the following day, which is more likely to kill you, an airplane accident or a car? Many people, let's say the majority, would say an airplane because that's the information that is available at that moment. It's available in their mind, even if, it's not inc even if the information is, is incorrect. The, the truth in that case is that people are more likely to die from a car accident than being killed from air travel. So in this case, a couch is more likely to kill you. You're nearly 30 times more likely to die from falling off furniture in your house than you are to be killed by a dog. Wow. So it, it seems that you know the, the Mexicans have um, maybe not a better, better sense of this, but their culture uh, in some way makes them more likely to guess uh, furniture, a couch, or a sofa will kill them. So maybe they have lots of experiences with kids and friends and family members like climbing over couches and falling off those couches and getting injured and hurt. But why in the United States then do people think that a dog is more likely to kill them? Do that many people have that kind of severe experiences with a dog barking at them by an owner who doesn't seem to care? You know, maybe that's why the dog is given as the answer in the United States. So that's already kind of interesting. Um, later today, you will get in a car accident. For the next couple of weeks, you will drive more cautiously Cautiously, that might make sense. Next one, which is more likely? Who is more likely to be CEO, this woman or this man? And in this case, which is more likely, which is more probable for Linda? 
she's more likely to be a bank teller or more likely to be a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. Given that during her student years, she was deeply concerned with issues of uh, discrimination and social justice. So the correct, so this is an example of representativeness. So in this case, both people are CEOs. Uh, Hillary Rowland, CEO of NewFaces.com, and Drew Houston, he is the CEO of Dropbox. At least this was accurate a couple of years ago. Oftentimes the CEOs change when the companies go through different kind of changes. But more likely, to, most people are more likely to um, choose the man, in this case, than the woman. Now I think this is changing um, over time. In some places, in some circles, this is going to change quicker. More people might assume that the woman is a CEO than the man. So over time, maybe the actual facts at hand of the world will change our, our guesses, but most people still would guess, given these two pictures, a man would be the CEO. Now the next one, this is also an example of representativeness and a conjunction fallacy. So we have the scenario in which this woman, Linda, as a student, was very active in various social causes. And we're given two possibilities, that either she's a bank teller now, or she's a bank teller and she's a feminist. Now let's give uh, the bank teller a probability. Let's say it's 5% because we think a person who was really interested while she was in college in feminist causes would be a bank teller would be very, very low. And out of 100, let's give it a, um, a number of 5%, extremely low amount. And let's give uh, the feminist a very high amount. Let's give it a 95 out of 100 because that makes a lot of sense to us because previously she really cared about these things. So the bank teller is a 5% probability and the bank teller um, is a probability of 5% and the feminist is a probability of 95%. Now let's compare um, those probabilities. So if we have 0 0.5 uh, times 0 0.95 we get a probability of 0.0475 at this point, we can see very clearly the bank teller is more likely to be, um, just probability-wise, being a bank teller versus being a bank teller and a feminist is the more likely scenario. So at this point, we'll end this, um, this program. There's a lot more information on these things. Like I said, today's cross-cultural decision-making um, presentation is really kind of a, a smattering of a couple things I've been asked previously to talk about something called cross-cultural decision-making cultural decision-making, but there's actually a lot of rich traditions in this research that you can investigate further. Um, this last slide that I have up right now is an example of a conjunction fallacy. So if you get into the world of decision sciences and research that more, um, you can learn a lot more about that. I, in a different podcast, I talk more about the conjunction fallacy, um, and you can hear more at that point as well. So with that, again, you can find more information at Dr dash z dot net that's dr dash z dot net this is dr z zachary brooks thanks for tuning in and in the meantime happy deciding